oligarchy was in control. Perfect. Okay. So, welcome all and welcome Michael. Good to have you here again. How are you? Good to be back. Our pleasure as usual. Let me just introduce you shortly first. I think most people know quite a lot of you, but anyway. Okay, so I take it short. You have been advisor to governments, warned correctly about debt crisis in Latin America and the great financial crisis 2008. You worked on Wall Street as an economist. One of your assignments uh, was to calculate, calculate how much it was possible to indebt Latin American countries. So all their export income was used to pay interest on loans. So another way of putting it is how much can you put uh, these countries in debt? <laughs> so that, that was the thing. And as an associate to Harvard, you led uh, research into 4,000 years of the history of debt, money, and the economy. Also, you have written several books. So I think that's kind of it. But yeah. even though with your extensive experience, I mean, I could talk, I guess, 30 minutes about <laughs> your CV. <laughs> We did that before. Yeah. So last time you showed us that big financiers historically has acted to write the rules for their benefit. And we call that financialization, though. Okay. And for, for that to work, finance must influence our way of thinking, mainly with regards to how we view money, debt, and value. So today is the thought that we will go into value. But before that, I think we could do a short summary of last time and i'm gonna share the screen here first <clears throat> and now there we please yeah okay so last time you was you were here you gave us a long-term view of money debt and the economy starting from sumer and babylonian time to today so, and you show that there has been thousands of years of power struggles where financial interests want to take control over society and the economy, and it goes on today. And if you look at this picture, we can simplify this by dividing history into two parts. First, from Sumer to Roman order, that's the green part in the picture. During that time, uh, debt jubilee by issuer of credit was common. Money was a tool to develop society. Local authorities use bookkeeping to keep track of transactions and to record debt and credit. An easier issuer used debt jubilee to cancel debt in order to preserve self-sustainability in society. And then if we jump over to the reddish part here from Roman order, okay, there we had a change. And suddenly private financiers in power due to their financial wealth Money viewed as wealth, a commodity, and scarce. Debt is sacrosanct, otherwise no financier will give any loans and the economy will fail without financing. This made it possible to use private debt as an instrument to grab property from others as long as you can enforce it. And you were also into, from your Canadian experience and a few other things, that government debt in own currency is not a problem. High private debt or government debt in foreign currency is a cause for crisis. We also have had Steve Keynes here, and he showed this clearly, even though common thinking seems to be the other way around. I try to make that short. Is there anything you'd like to add on that, Michael? No, that's uh, basically it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, you 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 mentioned that financiers write the rules for their uh, own benefit. I think the rules are called constitution and uh, bodies of law, and pro-financial rules are the distinguishing feature of Western civilization since classical antiquity, uh, and that represented a sharp break from the earlier Near Eastern practice. Uh, in Greece and Rome, you didn't have kings, uh, at least after the kings were overthrown by. Rome's oligarchy uh, early in its history. Uh, so the financial elites uh, succeeded in blocking the tradition of Near Eastern monarchies and canceling the debts and preventing an oligarchic uh, financial class from emerging. That really is what makes Western civilization so different from everything uh, that went before because without kings, without government, without uh, who the Greeks called tyrants, 
the oligarchy was in control. Uh, and it managed democracy by a number of political tricks. Uh, it had a Senate that uh, had a number of blocks like the pro bull in Athens. Uh, the Senate could decide what the public uh, assembly was allowed to discuss. And Rome's constitution uh, let everybody vote, but the rich people's votes counted for hundreds of times more than the votes of other people. It's almost like the United States today, where the donor class's contributions to uh, US politicians way overshadows uh, what the voters want, which is why uh, the uh, political rules in the United States reflect the donor class uh, rather than democracy, just like in Rome. Okay, so Rome was the credit for what we see today, kind of. Yes. Okay, okay. Thanks, thanks. So let's get over to financialis financialization, a difficult word for Finn. Okay, so could you just tell us a bit about what it is and what is their business plan and what foundations does it stand on and how it is played out in the world today? I think you said a bit about it, but please more. Well, financialization requires going into debt uh, in order to get basic needs. Uh, for housing, for instance, instead of paying rent to the landlords, uh, like you did ever since feudalism to the 19th century, now uh, homes are bought on credit. So that the rent that used to be paid to landlords is now paid to the banks as interest. Uh, rent is for paying interest. And over the course of a 30 year mortgage, the banks end up receiving more money in interest than the seller receives when he or she sells the property. So uh, the idea of paying rent to get property uh, as interest to the banks is the motto for commercial uh, real estate uh, investors. Uh, and this goes right throughout the economy. Instead of funding pensions or healthcare on a pay as you go basis as uh, they do in uh, most of Europe uh, by governments or employers, uh, current income has to be set aside in advance and invested in the financial market in stocks and bonds or uh, in just plain financial gambling. And uh, the hope is to uh, make money financially. But the way that fi the financial sector makes money is to uh, in, uh, really e exploit labor. And so labor uh, pays its pensions by financing the exploitation of labor. That's uh, what Marx called an internal contradiction. Uh, uh, and uh, the, fi the financialization process is basically anti-labor. Uh, and in as much as the policy aim of financialization is privatization, uh, it wants the assets, it wants to be the government. Uh, the uh, financialization wants the banks to be uh, the government, not elected officials. So financialization uh, and libertarian free markets aim at centralizing control in the form of the banks. So you have a much more centralized control uh, under financialization than you do uh, under democracy or even uh, state-run uh, economies. Uh, and so uh, what they do is they use this control in order to force the state to sell off its uh, public uh, enterprises, uh, its railroads, its pension plans, its, its healthcare. Uh, and uh, all of this uh, by privatizing uh, basic social utilities, uh, education, uh, healthcare, uh, you add uh, financial charges, management charges, uh, stock buybacks. Uh, they're built into the cost of providing these basic needs. So financialization sharply increases the cost of the economy. And it increases the cost of the economy uh, in the form of rents and interest and financial charges paid to the uh, basically the finance, insurance, and real estate sector, uh, the fire sector. Uh, in a way that ends up shrinking the economy and preventing its uh, ability to pay the debts. So financialization in one sense leads automatically to crises because its business plan is to get all the money for itself and impoverish the economy. Uh, but by impoverishing the economy, it does what Rome did. It, uh, it uh, leads to uh, austerity and, and a dark age. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see this in education, for instance. That's been financialized in the United States. It's provided freely uh, from Germany uh, to China. But in America, in order to get a college education or even uh, 
for uh, many high schools, uh, you have to uh, borrow uh, a loan and the process of uh, buying an education is like buying a loan. Uh, the prices, however much a bank is going to lend uh, the student or the homeowner uh, in order uh, to get this asset, uh, uh, the college uh, degree. And the problem is that all of this uh, leads to debt deflation. In other words, you pay more, and, uh, the financialization siphons off more and more of uh, the economy's income in the form of interest, uh, financial fees, penalties, and economic rents to the sectors that the financial, uh, uh, the, the banking sector uh, supports. Uh. Okay. Thanks a lot for that, Michael. So let's get into our perception of value and prosperity and, and start with classical economists. Uh, so can you, you know, start with give you give us your background and connection to the classical economics, and then tell us, you know, what was economy for them and their view of value, and how to prosper as a country. And also, lots of questions. So please get back if. I, <laughs> yeah. well, when I was teaching in the uh, 1960s and 70s, uh, the history of economic thought was still part of the uh, uh, economics curriculum. Students yeah. had to get uh, the. Uh, uh, history of economic thought is a core course, and they also had to study uh, economic history. So I taught history of economic thought, and most of my early books uh, were on the history of economic thought, especially international trade theory, uh, balance of payments theory, uh, American protectionism. Uh, and so I, I had to read uh, uh, all of the classical economists leading up uh, to Marx. and. The classical economics was almost diametrically opposed to the kind of economics that's taught today, which is why it's not taught in the economics courses anymore. Uh, the uh, idea of the classical economists from the physiocrats to Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, uh, and uh, uh, his followers were to, ta uh, to free economies from the landlord class. Uh, the classical economists wanted to develop uh, Britain, France, Germany, other countries industrially. And they thought saw that the only way of becoming competitive industrially was to minimize uh, the free lunch taken by uh, the landlord class in the form of rent uh, that they made in their sleep uh, and to get rid of monopolies, which had monopoly rent, much like land rent, uh, and indeed to get uh, rid of uh, uh, financial uh, rents uh, and natural resource rents uh, also. So the idea was to uh, free economies from having to pay rent so that uh, uh, economies would only pay uh, for people who uh, uh, actually contributed uh, to the production process. And this was to be done in uh, a number of ways. Either you would tax away uh, uh, land rent by uh, a rent tax, which is what uh, uh, John Stuart Mill urged, or by simply nationalizing the land. Uh, there was a debate over whether the state should take control of the land by buying out the landlords, by giving them uh, something or other, or just uh, plain uh, nationalizing it. But one way or other, the idea was to get rid of a landlord class. And this required, you know, how are you going to do this in uh, a, a governments that are parliaments, uh, like in Europe, that are dominated by the upper house, by the House of Lords in Britain and by the upper houses uh, in continental Europe. Well, you had to have democratic reform. And the theory was that democratic uh, reform, people would vote in their own interest and uh, they would vote uh, to shift the tax burden onto uh, the rentier class, the landlords, the monopolists, uh, the wealthy people, uh, not on labor and industry. And that was, uh, supposed to make uh, the economies much more uh, competitive industrially. That was the common denominator from uh, the physiocrats uh, all through Adam Smith and classical uh, economics uh, to free economies from the burden of unearned income and the class that collected rent in their sleep. Okay, so it seems like they wanted to go red, get rid of the overhead and focus on that the value was made by those who created something substantial that we could use in society. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so that, that's actually opposite to the financial sector, which extracts money from the uh, economy. And okay, the financial so sector is in a symbiosis with the landlord class because 80% of uh, bank loans, as we discussed last time, are mortgage loans. Uh, yeah. The financial sector's clientele are the rentier class, the very class that the classical economists wanted to free economies from. Okay, so when we look at the economy today, it seems like it's it's very very narrowed down to uh, individual agents and how to optimize or maximize you know their uh, profits or value or whatever you would call it. Uh, uh, but in a society, you actually have relations with others also. So is there a difference between how, how the classical economists view society and how the neoclassical views it? Sure, they're diametric opposites. Uh, neoliberalism is really, uh, it's not individualism so much because it, it ends up destroying individual choice. Uh, it's, it's an anti-government policy. Uh, what they call individualism is let's get rid of all government controls. We don't want government to have the power to uh, tax uh, the rentiers. We don't want government to have the power to regulate the banks. Let the banks decide what to make money on. Let the banks decide who's going to be on the Federal Reserve Board and the European Central Banks and uh, uh, in government. Uh, so it's not individualism, it's uh, dictatorialism. It used to be called fascism uh, a century ago. Uh, it's a, a centralized economy to, uh, uh, pull, to create an oligarchy uh, and deny 99% of the population a voice in policy making at all. That's called individualism and it's not. It's, it's, uh, it's fascism, basically. The idea is to prevent government from uh, doing anything that does not fa favor the fire sector uh, and uh, the monopolies uh, that it, it creates. So uh, they, they've rewritten uh, basically all of the laws to say, well, uh, there's no such thing as uh, unearned income. Uh, they, uh, the, the basis of neoclassical and uh, I call it neoliberal economics is to say that any all income is earned. And anybody uh, who earns any income at all, whether it's by uh, charging interest, whether it's by being a landlord, whether it's by inheriting stocks and bonds in a trust fund and living off it, all this is a contribution to production. So every, all the wealth is earned and other wealthy people are not the parasites that classical economics depicted them as. They're uh, productive people because how could the world exist without banks and landlords and, and uh, parasites? The host needs the parasite because life is all about the parasite. Even if it kills the host, the parasite is gonna go on and jump to another host. Uh, so basically you have an, an anti-life, anti-individual, predatory uh, economics using a rhetoric uh, that uh, is designed to distract attention from everything that Adam Smith and the classical free market economists were actually talking about. Okay, so what was free markets for Adam Smith? So what was free markets for Adam Smith then? Adam Smith, the free market was a market free from economic rent, free from interest and uh, from uh, the ability of the landlord class at his time, the rentier class and the financial class uh, to continue to wage wars, to try to grab more land, to get more land rent, to try to uh, create monopolies uh, and to try to uh, create uh, business uh, plans that essentially were exploitative. Uh, Adam Smith wanted a free market from the rentiers, whereas the neoliberals want a free market, a free government, free markets from the government for the rentiers. So it's the, it's the other way around again then? Yes. So how, how, how come that is allowed today then? I mean, why, why, do, why, why do everybody buy, buy into it? Or not everybody, but most anyway, because that's the, the common order everywhere. Well, they don't know there's an alternative. That's what uh, Margaret Thatcher said. There is no alternative. And if you don't teach the history of economic thought anymore, and if you don't teach uh, economic history in the economics curriculum, 
how are people to know that there is an alternative and that things don't have to be this way? The economy doesn't have to suffer from debt uh, deflation. Uh, it doesn't have to go into debt to get an education. It doesn't have, you don't have to go uh, bankrupt uh, to pay your medical bills. Uh, you, you don't have to save up your pensions by lending money to a company that's trying to cut your wages. Uh, it doesn't, uh, there's, there's no real economic discussion of how econ economics really works. Instead, you have a kind of parallel universe of how an economy would work in a completely different world, uh, uh, different from the real world in which government didn't exist and which somehow uh, the bankers were very nice and ran everything to help everything grow. And the bankers and the landlords were the, and the monopolists were the most productive organizers of society trying to protect it, protect it from labor and uh, industry trying to uh, uh, develop their own prosperity. Okay, thanks. That, that takes me actually to, so, so if you look into the state's role then, so what was the state's role according to the classical economists? The state's role for classical economics is to uh, uh, regulate the economy to prevent uh, uh, landlords from uh, uh, monopolizing wealth by taxing uh, economic rent or by uh, nationalizing uh, uh, the land. Uh, it was the, the state's role would be to uh, make anti-monopoly legislation, such as you're seeing in Europe today uh, against uh, Google and uh, uh, other uh, uh, technology uh, companies uh, to promote environmental regulations that if a, a company, an oil company uh, uh, pollutes, it, uh, uh, either uh, you prevent it from uh, polluting the environment or uh, you fine it uh, to prevent it. Uh, the role of government is to protect the economy from the rentiers, not serve the rentiers. Okay, thanks. And then we take the other way around then, by neoclassical economists, what do they say is the role of the government? To disappear and to relinquish everything and to turn all of its power over to the banks and the rich people and the 1%. Uh, and the only role of the government is to, uh, to do what it did in Rome, which was to assassinate any popular leader who was for taxing or uh, canceling uh, the debts or uh, advocating the uh, redistribution of land. Uh, the role of the state for neoliberals is to protect the oligarchy from the people and to prevent democracy and to roll back everything that the 19th century was fighting for, uh, creating a parliamentary democracy in order to, uh, to uh, free economies from the rentiers. You're, roll it back and uh, essentially they want neo-feudalism. Uh, so we don't have to call it fascism. We can call it neo-feudalism. We want to put things the way they were uh, back in the, the 12th century. Mm. Wow. Okay, it seems, <laughs> it seems like it's got a bit of a backward <laughs> to say the least, so, but so, so, what should the role of economy be then, according to, to uh, uh, classical uh, economics? Well, not only according to, I mean, what should it really be in reality? You mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. it should prevent rent seeking. Uh, the whole idea of uh, an efficient economy is you don't want unearned income because somebody has to pay this unearned income. If you have uh, uh, landlords, uh, charging uh, whatever they want. If you have banks inflating the price of property so that people have to pay in America uh, up to 43% uh, of their income for a government guaranteed uh, mortgage, then you're going to be priced uh, out of the market. So uh, a, a good economy would uh, prevent rent seeking. Uh, it would either tax away the economic rent, uh, which otherwise would be pledged to the bank, and it would regulate uh, monopolies. And most important, uh, money and credit should be public utilities. That's the problem. They shouldn't be, be privatized. If the problem today is that the rent rentier sector, the landlord class, the monopolists, the oil and gas uh, industries, the natural resource uh, rent recipients, uh, if the problem of all these is that they're, they're backed by the banks, uh, and it's the banks and the financial sector that create trusts is the mother of monopoly, then if you keep money 
end uh, credit in the public domain, then uh, credit will be extended for purposes that actually help promote prosperity, not that uh, counteract prosperity. Uh, government uh, money creation by deficit spending uh, is spent into the economy uh, for uh, labor, uh, for industry, to, uh, to build infrastructure uh, for productive purposes. Whereas uh, uh, if you privatize bank credit, uh, that siphons off money from the economy. And the question is, what's going to become priority, uh, the, the host or the parasite? And the government should help the host, not the parasite. Yeah, well, it's basically a question of what builds a good society, I guess, you know, and what is prosperity and what is value truly, you know, back to that question. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, that really is the, uh, that really was the crux of classical economics, uh, the value uh, and price. Uh, classical economics said that, well, the price exceeds, but we pay many prices that don't weigh over what the value of things are. And the difference is economic rent. Uh, if it's okay for people to pay the cost of construction, constructing a house or producing a commodity, but if you have to pay on top of this uh, interest and all sorts of financial charges uh, and rent extraction, that's not value. That's empty price. That's price without value. And that's what economic rent is. Uh, so that really uh, is the, the key consideration. Uh, for uh, economic reform and for, for thinking about how economies work. Okay, thanks a lot. So then, is there any country that today builds its economy uh, different, differently or according to more the classical economics uh, view? Well, the closest to it is China, uh, which uh, is following pretty much the same uh, industrial logic that uh, Britain and Germany and the United States followed uh, in the 19th century. Uh, it's protecting its industry. It's, uh, pr it uh, is trying to prevent uh, an, a financial oligarchy from emerging uh, and gaining power. Uh, so uh, it's doing what uh, everybody thought uh, industrial capitalism was evolving to before World War I. China's really what uh, the kind of society that people expected Europe and the United States to evolve into uh, before it was all sidetracked by uh, financialization. So uh, uh, China has kept uh, banking in the public domain through the Bank of China, and uh, it can decide what to uh, create uh, credit for. And it's creating credit largely to uh, build more factories, to build infrastructure for the Built and Road uh, Initiative, uh, to minimize uh, uh, military spending as much as possible, uh, and simply to uh, add economic efficiency, to provide education freely, uh, provide health uh, health care, and not to turn labor into commodities, not to make health care a commodity, but as a public right, not to make uh, money a commodity, but as a uh, uh, essentially a uh, uh, a public uh, a utility. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So, but so have you been working in China in what way? Uh, well, I was a, uh, I'm a professor at a number of Chinese universities. Uh, I was a professor at uh, Peking University uh, uh, and uh, right now uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm, I talk with government officials about how they can avoid uh, financialization. Uh, one of the things I'm urging, one of the problems that China has right now is uh, the same problem that you have in the United States and, and in Europe. What do you do with localities that are running, uh, unable to balance the budget? Uh, and my recommendation to China is what I would, would recommend uh, to Europe and America. You have uh, federal revenue sharing. Uh, right now in China, localities in the rural areas uh, are having to balance their budgets by uh, selling off or leasing property uh, to real estate developers. Uh, and that's the only way they can get money, uh, much as Chicago and uh, other US cities are selling uh, uh, rights to uh, parking meters or toll roads uh, for that. And I'm urging the central bank to uh, create the money revenue sharing so that uh, 
government, local governments do not have to sell off uh, the land, uh, or if the land is sold off, to try to uh, tax back the uh, rising economic rental value uh, of this land so that uh, you don't have a rentier class uh, developing. Uh, and the second thing, of course, is what we're talking about. Right now, China sends uh, most of its, uh, uh, many of its students to the United States to study economics here. And it made this decision in around the 1980s, thinking that, well, we see that America is the most prosperous country in the world that's running the world. How are you going to learn economics? Let's send it there uh, and uh, find out uh, what it's done. Well, it turns out that uh, what they learn, the economic students uh, in America don't learn how America got rich because uh, that's not taught anymore. That's classical economics. <laughs> uh, we're taught about how to go to business school and load the economy down with debt. So I'm uh, developing uh, an alternative uh, agenda, an alternative uh, syllabus of the history of economic thought. And uh, it'll, uh, my uh, summary of my ideas are going to be published uh, in uh, next month uh, uh, in Chinese and American. Uh, I have a series of lectures that are right now on uh, YouTube uh, uh, in, Ameri in English with uh, subtitles that are sponsored uh, by the Lingnam uh, University. Uh, faculty in uh, Hong Kong, and uh, that's that's going to be later uh, publicly available. I think the first lecture had 148,000 viewers, so you have an idea of how much uh, interest there is in China of seeing that there is an uh, alternative uh, to neoliberal thought, and uh, uh, the uh, they cert that uh, if they want to find out how America got prosperous, uh, they actually look at how America did get prosperous. Uh, in the 19th century and early 20th century, not how it's uh, not getting prosperous anymore and is destroying its prosperity. Uh, and if you, if China were to send its students to America, the first thing they learn is that uh, China never should have uh, developed, that it was a, a big mistake for China to uh, make its population uh, more richer because that's interfering with the free market. And if China would have left the free market, then you'd still have... Uh, a, a coolie trade. You'd still have impo poverty. You'd still have uh, the way uh, the free market is the status quo. And uh, they're taught that China never really should have developed. It was all a mistake. And they should immediately uh, just dissolve the government and turn power over to the banks and, and say uh, it was all a big mistake. Well, you can imagine uh, what the Chinese students uh, must be laughing about when they uh, hear these courses, but uh, they have to get the degree because that's what they're here for. Uh, and it's, uh, it's become sort of a union card. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to pr uh, revive the alternative uh, discussion of classical economics, which of course is exactly what led into Marxism. Now, of course, China uh, says it, it's a Marxist country, quite right. But I'm saying that, well, Marx uh, was uh, the culmination of a whole classical tradition that led naturally to culminate in Marxism. So I'm showing how, uh, the classical foundations uh, of Marxism, you could say. Oh, so what are the classical foundations of Marxism? Rent theory. Uh, okay, we're the back to that. Value and price theory. Uh, value, price, and rent theory. Okay. In a nutshell. Okay, okay. So what you're saying is actually that China did what they say we shouldn't do in, in the Western countries. They used the state's government to create money to build the country. Yes. Okay, and that is a bad thing. According, according to, 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 to common uh, uh, education. That's interfering with the free market. If you yeah. had a free market, only the banks would make would uh, create a credit, and they'd create credit for takeover loans uh, uh, to buy out companies and uh, essentially uh, for corporate rating. So the question is, what are you going to create credit and money for? That's the real issue. What is the, perp the aim of uh, money and credit? Yeah. What should we use our resources for? That's true. Okay. So is there anything else you think that we should learn from China, from the economy? I'm not talking about the political system because that might be a bit sensitive, but, but from the uh, economical point of view. Uh, j just, you can look at the problems that China's having right now, for instance, yeah. uh, it's, it's uh, property prices are going up. 
Yeah. Uh, there are a number of companies uh, that are in trouble. Uh, you want to see, let's, let's look at how the financial dynamics as opposed to the industrial dynamics are developing there. Watch and see what the balance is between finance and industry and watch and see uh, whether uh, China is able to maintain a uh, predominantly uh, labor-oriented industrial strategy and uh, resist privatization uh, uh, and monopoly. Well, you've already seen that they've uh, limited uh, Frank, uh, uh, Jack Ma's uh, attempt to use uh, uh, the uh, ANT uh, system as a uh, telephone uh, credit by saying, no, only the government can create credit. Uh, are not used. So they, they already have a, a pretty uh, good uh, feel for this. And watch it how uh, they're uh, de-dollarizing de their economy and making themselves independent of uh, the whole U.S. system, which is designed basically U.S. diplomacy, which is aimed at spreading financialization throughout the world. Okay. Could you tell us something about the Belt and Road Initiative? Because it's, it's, it's written quite a lot in Swedish media about it, but it's never like uh, any deep understanding what's written, I would say. <laughs> well, I, can't, I don't want to get into detail, but I'll get into the basic principle. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is, when you're developing ports and other uh, shipping and railroads and basic infrastructure, uh, is what they're trying to put in place, uh, trade and exchange. Are you going to do this for profit or not for profit? Now, uh, a lot of uh, uh, neoliberals have criticized China for the Belt and Road Initiative by saying, wait a minute, you know, people invested in the Panama Canal. That was worthwhile. Uh, we all need a Panama Canal, but the first investors all lost their money. Uh, they went bankrupt. Uh, and the same thing with the, the Suez Canal. Very important for world growth, but they lost all the money. It was a it was a financial disaster. Well, China's response quite simply is: Look, we're not in uh, we're not building canals and ports uh, to make money off the ports as such. We're building these ports uh, in order to develop the economy and make it possible trade and exchange, so that the overall economy will be prosperous and that there will be a shared prosperity. Uh, between uh, from China to spreading out to uh, the whole length of the Belt and Road uh, to Europe, developing all the economies there. Uh, instead of uh, lending like the World Bank would do, uh, which would be uh, you know, le uh, basically lending for uh, plantation agriculture and for uh, uh, very expensive American engineering firms, uh, China's looking at the economy as a broad system, not here is a profit-making deal, here's a profit-making deal, here is a profit-making deal. They're, they're looking at the economy as a, a mixed economy, a mixed public and private system. Uh, and uh, uh, how do uh, ports and the other investments uh, that uh, in infrastructure uh, that China is developing uh, actually uh, reward the country. Well, obviously, uh, the com countries that are receiving uh, this investment in ports uh, have to pay something for it. But what they pay, China, the, the prosperity created by the ports and uh, uh, other infrastructure is what enables them to pay. So China's making productive loans uh, to these countries. And if the country is not able to pay, it doesn't then foreclose on their property and say, aha, you have to sell off your oil wells to American firms. You have to sell off your mineral rights to American mining companies. You have to uh, you know, privatize. China s simply writes down the debts or defers payment. It, 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 doesn't try to, it doesn't try to make loans to countries to foreclose. And uh, it doesn't tell countries, well, wait a minute, uh, uh, since uh, it will lend you the money uh, to pay the debt, but you have to destroy your labor unions. Uh, you have to agree to assassinate all of uh, your land reformers. You have to agree to kill uh, your labor leaders. Uh, you have to agree not to teach uh, any economics, but the neoliberal economics. That's what the USAID, the IMF, and the World Bank uh, say. And uh, China is not trying to uh, finance the impoverishment of countries, which is the business plan of the IMF, the World Bank, and the USAID. The business, they all serve the financial sector. The financial business plan is to impoverish the economy so that the 1%, the, the financial class, ends up with all the wealth and all the money, leaving everybody else to shrink.
uh, that's uh, the opposite of what China is trying to do. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Michael. Th th then I have actually a final question before, before we take some Q&A. How does QE fit into the financialization of the economy or society? Well, its aim is to support asset price inflation. Uh, it, it, it began uh, after the, in 2008, 2009, after uh, the junk mortgage and uh, the American bank fraud crisis of junk mortgages uh, and just the most massive bank fraud uh, in, in modern history. The idea was that uh, uh, the banks had lent uh, mortgage money so much in advance of the actual value of property with debt service so far above the actual rental yield of uh, uh, the real estate that uh, the real estate prices were going to collapse. And uh, uh, if that would have happened, uh, then uh, the banks would have gone bankrupt uh, because it's, uh, the bank claims, the bank uh, reserves and collateral were what uh, used to be called fictitious capital. In other words, it was a bank claim on the balance sheet, it said the banks are worth X amount of money, but uh, the real value of the collateral backing its loans was much less. Uh, Frederick Soddy called this virtual wealth. It wasn't real wealth in the form of real tangible real estate and means of production. It was uh, virtual wealth claims on, on this uh, real wealth way in advance. So the purpose of quantitative easing was to come in, flood the market with a lower interest rates by so much that people could afford to borrow and speculate on credit. So uh, quantitative easing was a means of subsidizing uh, speculation uh, in order to keep the uh, overvaluation of property uh, uh, going and uh, essentially to turn the economy into a Ponzi scheme. Uh, for central banks, the role is to serve the interest of the banking sector. Uh, that's why there are central banks as opposed to the national treasury. Uh, and you load the economy with enough credit to borrow its way out of debt. That was the word that was uh, the phrase that was used. Well, we're in the Ponzi uh, phase of the business cycle, uh, to use Hyman Minsky's uh, phrase. Uh, new invest in a Ponzi scheme, uh, there's really nothing there. Uh, but uh, prices have been going up and people think, well, there must be something there. The only way to repay the early entrance into a Ponzi scheme is to have new investors. Well, in this case, uh, you have new bank credit coming in and the new bank credit is uh, coming in. Today, the, uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, the Federal Reserve has been buying not only stocks and bonds, but junk bonds. There are companies that uh, Sheila Baer is the head of the FDIC. I think we talked about this last time, last lecture. Uh, she said, look, these are zombie companies. These are bankrupt companies. And the Federal Reserve is buying their junk bonds uh, just to, so that uh, the investors in the junk bonds won't lose money. Uh, this is crazy. So uh, the, uh, the, the role of the uh, uh, Quantitative easing is to keep the illusion going, to keep the illusion going that if the stock and bond markets are booming, then uh, somehow the economy is succeeding and everything is uh, uh, going okay. Uh, so the, uh, the business plan of the uh, financial sector uh, that's behind this quantitative easing is, well, you need asset price inflation, even while it's causing debt deflation for the economy at large. Uh, you, you have to privatize public utilities. Uh, uh, and essentially, uh, to do all this, you have to uh, shift control of uh, the government into the hands of the banks that can use uh, the, the treasury not to run a deficit to spend into the economy. Well, right now, as you know, with COVID, the American and the European economies are absolutely strapped. This is a case where the government should be creating credit to pay into the economy, uh, to support, uh, to prevent uh, uh, individuals and small businesses and large businesses from going uh, insolvent uh, when uh, their uh, employees can't work because of the virus. But instead of creating credit to spend into the economy, instead of saying, okay, there's unemployment, we're going to build up infrastructure, the, uh, the federal, the central bank, quantitative easing is only used to finance, uh, to buy stocks and bonds and real estate already in place, not to help the economy, 
not to create new means of production, not to create infrastructure. So uh, it's uh, an, uh, enormously one-sided. And to do that, you have to essentially take over the government and make sure that uh, democracies don't have a choice in, uh, uh, in uh, making policy in the interests of labor or industry. Yeah. So it seems like that is also one way of feeding the financial industry to secure prices in the market rather than secure jobs and cash flow in businesses and for people. Yes, that's exactly right. Mm, okay. The, the, debt, the whole idea that debt is, uh, you talked before about Rome. Uh, what Rome did was bequeath a body of law that we're still in that makes all of this uh, possible. Uh, the, the principle of Roman law is the opposite, to get back to what you said at the beginning of the discussion, of Near Eastern law. Debt is sacrosanct. Uh, Rome bequeathed its uh, pro-creditor legal philosophy to Western civilization. So what's called the security of property rights is actually insecurity of these rights because it's uh, the, secure, the priority of creditor privileges to foreclose on the homes and the assets of debtors. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's basically uh, the rule, what uh, the US called the rule of law is a creditor-based law. It's uh, the rule of uh, law is written by uh, lawyers for the banks and the corporate sector, not uh, written by uh, democracies uh, at large. So uh, whenever uh, there's an attempt to uh, regulate uh, finance, to prevent monopolies, to prevent global warming, that's called interfering with financial property rights, uh, as if somehow that's a bad thing. When the whole purpose of government is to interfere with financial property rights, whose effect is to uh, impoverish the economy. Yeah. Yeah, to limit might be to protect. It depends on where you stand on the line, right? Uh, well, oh. hello, Michael. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> so, so um, OK, thanks a lot for that, it, Michael. It sounds very much an American perspective, which is fair enough. But um, listening to your analysis, much of which I can agree with and some of which I find strange. Um, but are you saying what are you saying we should do? To ch what changes are you suggesting that we make? That's my question, really. Um, thank you. I think that's what I was talking about. Uh, the change is to follow, uh, to free economies from the rentier class. Uh, wow. To treat uh, uh, money and credit as a public utility to be used uh, to promote prosperity, not to cannibalize economies. No, I understand that in principle, but how do you suggest that we go about doing that? Oh, each country is different. I don't see how it can be done in the United States without breaking up the Democratic Party. Uh, you have <laughs> a duopoly here of the two parties that yeah. are essentially the same party. And uh, most Americans uh, want, as I said, uh, uh, socialized medicine and free education, uh, and they're not getting it. Uh, most Americans want uh, to tax uh, the, the, the wealthy people. We're not getting it. So uh, you have to somehow uh, recapture government just like you did in the 19th century. Well, the whole 19th century leading to World War I was an attempt to democratize economies, to reform them in order to uh, get rid of the financial sector. And it failed. We didn't, get in, we didn't end up with uh, the classical economic ideal. We went up, ended up with what we have today. Uh, essentially, especially after Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in the 1980s uh, and the whole uh, neoliberalism. So uh, obviously you have to change uh, government in order to uh, uh, write new sets of uh, tax laws and uh, right. laws and others. Do you, Michael, do you think that we should take money creation out of the hands of the banks and put it into the public domain? Yeah, of course. That's, the ba that's why uh, uh, I supported the Chicago plan among other things, uh, in the United States uh, 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 for many years uh, with, I think, uh, Steve Zawenga's group that uh, uh, you've discussed before. But yes, uh, that's, of course, money creation should be in the hands of government, not banks, because uh, governments uh, create money for different purposes than banks do. They don't, governments don't create money to take over existing assets and squeeze more money out of them. They uh, spend money into the economy to create prosperity, to create assets, to create infrastructure, to create industry. 
Of course, it should be uh, in the hands of government. That's the single most important uh, uh, change. And is that, that is that like the the central is that like the central bank would would be the sole creator or something like that? No, central banks are are uh, there to serve the. Uh, the commercial banks. Some well, I'm sure they could be made to serve whoever we like, but who would who would create the money? And if I'm a small business and I want 50,000 euros of a loan, would I then go to, in some way to the to the public lenders with my application? So the so the the government would take over the entirety of creating new money to make small loans to everybody around the country. Uh, here's how it would be done, and here's what the Chicago plan would do. Uh, the 100% reserves. Uh, of course, you would uh, do just what you do now. You'd go to the bank, uh, and you'd try to get a loan. Now, the problem is the bank, uh, in order to make the loan to you, uh, if it doesn't already have the deposits there, it's going, uh, it's going to need money or, uh, in order to create the credit for you. Uh, the, uh, if uh, you're borrowing for a productive purpose, uh, not to take over a company, uh, but for uh, a, a legal purpose, the government will simply uh, uh, create the reserves for the bank to lend you the money. The government okay. will be creating money, but it will only create money for banks to make particular kinds of loans. So if you want the bank, uh, if you want to borrow uh, to buy a house, government will provide the money for it. If you want to start a business and that the bank finds credit worthy, the banks will still be able to uh, judge your credit worthiness, who gets it, uh, but uh, they cannot create credit out of thin air. They can't create it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, is this, is, is there, um, I'm not familiar with the Chicago uh, plan, but where could I read a 20 or 40 page um, description of this? Well, uh, I was the uh, advisor for Dennis Kucinich, the presidential candidate here, and uh, he had uh, promoted the uh, uh, Chicago plan. So if you put in Chicago plan and then... Okay, I looked that up. And I, see H. Uh, and, uh, uh, I, I know that uh, Steve Zarlenga at, uh, uh, put in uh, with a Z uh, uh, has a lot of meetings where Steve Teen and I uh, and others uh, were speaking. Okay, uh, thanks very much. I've taken up a lot of everybody's time, so um, I'll stop now. Thank you. Thanks very much. I really appreciate your analysis, uh, uh, Michael. And my question is this. The, the, uh, the, um, uh, the Chicago plan has evolved into, of course, the, the, the Kucinich bill uh, the, 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 in the United States, the NEED Act, which does uh, set up essentially the government as a creator of money and makes banks essentially, well, I guess banks can lend like other non-financial, like other non-banks do, that is it with pre-existing money. One of the questions that has come up, and you're undoubtedly aware of this question that was raised by, by the authors of the book, The End of Banking, was that, well, if you just essentially impose the regulation of the, of the NEED Act uh, uh, that Kucinich generated, that limits essentially what banks can do. It won't stop the essentially creation of banks, a creation of money in the shadow banking industry. And you've got to do something more than that. So my question to you is, what would happen if in fact, it, in terms of shadow banking as we know it, uh, as, as a result of simply re, uh, ending bank creation of money and shifting money creation to the government? That's Thanks. Right. Advocating, that's what the 100% reserves mean. Uh, that's, that, uh, that's exactly right. I mean, there will still be uh, uh, rich, rich people uh, with money to lend, but with, uh, uh, with financial reform, you need tax reform to go with it. You have to tax away uh, the existing uh, economic rent, and none of this will work unless you wipe out the overburden of debt that already exists. You cannot restabilize the economy. You cannot get out of today's depression without writing down the debts, canceling them. So that's going to cause, the, that's going to end a lot of the assets that the shadow banking industry has. Uh, you will also, you, with a proper tax policy and with a tax, uh, a debt cancellation, uh, you'll, uh, you'll cure, you'll create an environment where uh, government, uh, money creation will work.
Okay. In other words, what, what if China uh, let uh, uh, many, many billionaires uh, all of a sudden begin uh, buying out uh, companies and creating monopolies? Uh, wouldn't happen there. Uh, and it, wouldn't, it didn't used to happen in the United States under the uh, anti-monopoly laws here. So you, you need, uh, you, you can't reform just one part of the economy, like finance together. Economic reform, an econ economy is a system. So you need systemic reform. Uh, monetary and financial reform have to go together with fiscal reform, uh, policy reform, and uh, legal reform. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot. Hope you're happy with that. Uh, next person is, I think it was Alec Scherer. Um, so um, we live in Switzerland and I'm here with my father. And my question is, um, Michael, you said that um, democracies don't really decide uh, which policies and laws are enacted. In Switzerland, we have um, the right to make um, a referendums on laws that we do not like, and we can vote, vote on them as a people, and we can do uh, yes, initiatives. initiatives to propose um, a change to the con constitution that we can that will be also voted on by, by the people. So, do you think that um, it has an influence on how much um, the economy is beneficial to the people? And if yes, um, or do you also think that it would be um, a good change for societies and democracies in general if such rights, rights uh, were um, in most of the countries? Well, a referendum is democratic. Uh, I don't think that uh, the United States or most of Europe uh, is our democracies. They're oligarchies. But a referendum is certainly uh, a democratic uh, policy within uh, an overall oligarchic structure. So if you can get a referendum and have the government actually do something, that would be fine. In the United States, if you had a referendum uh, wanting a, uh, a decent, productive uh, a policy, uh, the problem is it would go to the Supreme Court. Uh, that is an ultra right wing uh, uh, group in the Supreme Court which say, well, I'm sorry, you're interfering with free markets. Uh, so we're just nullifying the re referendum. It's against the Constitution as we, uh, unelected members of the Supreme Court, interpret it. So we have problems in America that you don't have in Switzerland. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Michael. Uh, let's go to Don. I think you, I've seen you before, but you up again, Don. Don Wilford. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. So, hi, Michael. It's a pleasure to meet you and listen to you. My question is a bit philosophical, um, but as a student of ancient history, uh, I imagine uh, Egyptian slaves and Roman soldiers and medieval peasants imagining a world with less work, more leisure, more joy, uh, freeing the human spirit. And yet here we are today still talking about more work. We all seem to want to work more. And of course, value comes from work and value is what's captured by uh, owners who exploit their ownership to, uh, if you like, um, enslave other people. So do you think we'll ever be able to imagine a different world, one in which there's less work <laughs> and sure. more of what the human experience is supposed to be about? I wrote a book, uh, Financialization and its Discontents, about this. Uh, suppose that you were uh, back in 1945 and you were told about all of the productivity gains that have been made in the last 75 years. You'd think that, oh, gee, we can have a four day week. We can have a three day week. There's so much productivity that uh, we don't have to work. And yet, somehow, the more productivity goes up, the more people are working overtime. That's what's making productivity going up. You're squeezing more and more uh, out of uh, labor uh, and paying it uh, less and less. So uh, obviously, uh, the uh, fact that people have to work so much harder now uh, uh, than they used to uh, when I was uh, went into the workforce uh, it isn't a product of nature. Uh, it doesn't have to be this way. It's the product of policy. And they're working basically to pay off the debts that they're running up. 
So all this extra work they're doing is really just to carry the financial sector and the fire sector and the rest of the rentier sector on their shoulders. And if you get rid of the rentier sector, you won't have to work so hard. Thanks for the question, Don, and great answer, Michael. <laughs> so I uh, jump over to Stamatis. I think you're next on queue. Yes. Welcome. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for for your talk. I'm very interested uh, every time uh, you make such a, such a talk. Um, my question is this: um, I was thinking that if we uh, if we really had a Chicago plan uh, based economy, where uh, uh, where reserves were in place and uh, there should be some way which is not exactly clear in the Chicago plan of how to increase the money supply. So this is usually by, de by, by, de defi by deficit spending of the government. Uh, but this doesn't say that this deficit wouldn't go to the fire sector. This doesn't say that financialization would be over. So uh, the only two things that would be different in my understanding is that we wouldn't have any account of how much of this money goes there. And that would be uh, uh, only in, gover uh, in government's books we had. And, um, and uh, I don't know, uh, is there any other difference? Uh, how would we beat financialization? It wouldn't be by changing the banking system, in fact. It would, it would require other kinds of laws. Yes, uh, you're, you're right. That's why I said the economy is a system. There have to be other changes. Of course, there would still be the government. And if the government wanted to uh, keep spending on uh, the military industrial complex or to go to war or to subsidize uh, uh, corrupt uh, privatizers and financiers, uh, then you'd have to change the government. But you're right, the, uh, the, uh, stopping the banks from creating credit uh, solves the problem of bank credit. It doesn't solve uh, the rest of the problems that you just brought up. There has to be an overall uh, political reform. That's why it was called socialism in the 19th century. And I guess uh, uh, it, we could still call it socialism today. You'd need a socialist reform. Uh, uh, and a thoroughgoing political reform uh, to restructure what's government all about. So it's not only what is uh, money and the financial sector all about, it's what's the role of government? And uh, uh, is it to help society? Is it to help the 99% or to help the 1%? Is it to help clean up uh, the world environment? Is it to promote peace or is it to promote world war? Like uh, uh, is the role of government today in Europe and America? Okay, so uh, I'll add uh, one more question, a follow-up one. So in our case, in, in the EU, we have, a, in my understanding, a problem with uh, the situation because uh, uh, the thing is out of, of the hands of governments. It's uh, inside treaties. Uh, there, it is inside treaties. It's in the Lisbon NATO. Treaty. Basically, your governments are a branch of NATO. To make <laughs> Yes, well, that's well, that's uh, one step further than I wanted to take it. Uh, in the international set, yes, that's the, the situation because uh, the banking system is uh, eventually dependent on New York banks and uh, uh, that's why we depend on NATO then. <laughs> no, you depend on NATO. The other the way around. So you have corrupt politicians, uh, right-wing politicians, financed by corrupt uh, right-wing groups. You have a right-wing government because Europe is not very democratic. Right, but how does this make us dependent on, on NATO? Uh, that's who essentially pays the checks to buy your politicians, uh, you, especially in Brussels. Okay. Uh, my uh, friend uh, Paul Craig Roberts was uh, Undersecretary of the Treasury uh, for International Affairs 
And uh, he explained to me that the principle uh, to get is simply you can buy politicians and European politicians are about the cheapest in the world uh, because they're, they're just so brief. <laughs> I won't disagree there. <laughs> okay, thank you, Michael. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Tamatis. Then we go to Jeremy. So if you unmute yourself, I hope I pronounced that right. There we go. Thank you, Josie. Hi, Michael. Um, would you walk us through a little bit about debt deflation? It's something you've mentioned before. Now, debt deflation, as I understand it, is one amateur results from it is a consequence of the repayment of principal interest and fees to banks, which accept them by reducing the liability side, which happens to be our money supply. Um, that's my understanding of debt deflation, but I'd be interested in hearing yours. And in addition, what happens when government deficit spending for, let's say, the most worthy of causes that we might all agree with, not for oligarchic causes, what happens when that collides with debt deflation? Doesn't that still create an enormous disparity between the bank reserves that banks get, which accrue interest, and the deposits that mere depositors get, which disappeared via the repayment of principal. No, there's no uh, uh, conflict at all. Uh, now we're getting to the area of modern monetary theory. Uh, Stephanie Kelton has just published a, a good book uh, explaining uh, all of this. Uh, and uh, the whole, uh, the uh, University of Missouri at Kansas City, where I used to uh, be on the faculty, uh, spent years and years uh, explaining all this. Uh, what you're suggesting is was called the crowding out theory. You think if the government spends money, there's less to be spent uh, uh, in the domestic economy. The government can create as much money as it wants. Uh, it has no connection at all uh, with uh, uh, crowding out money elsewhere uh, in the economy. I don't believe I was elucidating the crowding out theory, uh, the de but deficit spending does increase bank reserves or banks' holdings of treasuries. They create, they, they augment bank assets. Bank liabilities is e even if the liabilities, uh, e even if it's spent for, let's say, some flood worker, some fire worker, that individual is simply getting a bank IOU, a deposit, and as they repay principal interest and fee back to the bank, is that not debt deflation resulting in a disparity between what banks are able to earn as in what you via describe is not how the world works at all. That's a, a, a crazy theory. The government uh, doesn't have to borrow from the banks. Again, Stephanie Kelton has explained all of this. The government can create money. It doesn't need to borrow from the banks. It doesn't need to pay interest. Uh, on, on uh, bonds if it creates the money. It can just print the money. There's no connection at all. You're, you're teaching, you're uh, suggesting a right-wing uh, Austrian theory that's been thoroughly discredited. I know you're not doing it on purpose, but uh, that's not how the world works. And uh, you'll have to read about modern monetary theory and or look at the Federal Reserve Bulletin and look at the balance sheet uh, and just trace the flow of credit yourself uh, and if you look at the statistics, you'll find out that uh, what you've described is just a fantasy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. We have uh, Reitze Kaiser. I hope that was like kind of proper pronunciation. <laughs> you are unmuted, but we can't hear you. No, you're not unmuted. Okay. No, you are. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone here from The Hague, the Netherlands. You did pronounce my name uh, correctly, Reitz Keizer. Um, I'm very, very happy with this lecture of, uh, of Michael. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, uh, for the, the, especially the, the, the fresh economic per perspective you are, you are giving. Um, I'm thinking uh, fighting the fire sector is difficult. Influencing the democratic discussion is also difficult. Um, what we need is uh, a sustainable development goal number 18. I, I tell it my students 
uh, there is missing uh, 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 SDG 18 about monetary, financial, and tax reform. But it's understandable it's missing because the, 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 the whole world would be against it. So another option is perhaps uh, electronic uh, digital money. What do you think of parallel local monies to, to, to create a, 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 a new flow of money around the fire sector, let them stay where they are and, and let, let us focus on, on creating a, a, a new economy. It, it doesn't work. This has been discussed for a uh, hundred years. Uh, if it would have worked, uh, the Weimar, the note guild uh, in Germany in the Weimar period uh, would have worked out. Uh, uh, it, it has to be at the federal level uh, because basically what, what is it that gives money its uh, value? Uh, and what that is, is uh, the ability to use money to pay taxes. Uh, and the only way that localities could create money is uh, to make it acceptable in uh, paying an uh, enormous amount of taxes. And most localities just uh, uh, would not be able uh, to do that because uh, one locality would be played off against another uh, and uh, it would uh, end up uh, not being successful. So in practice, uh, the local currency, uh, much as it, uh, people would like to think of it uh, as working, uh, it doesn't work out in practice. It's a long story, but there's a, a huge literature about that. Okay, uh, it's a it's a pity because uh, 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 fighting the fire sector is 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 very very difficult, and I and I I, I don't see any perspective that 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 will change uh, in in the near near future. So uh, yeah, we need a revolution. No, <laughs> no, yeah, local I, money creation is a revolution. I I don't like revolutions. Um, I, I was I was also very impressed about you. Your, your, your story about the Jubilee in, in ancient history, because uh, 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 at home, my, my father reading in the Bible, he told us from Leviticus 25, that thou shalt not economically oppress one another. My father was an economist. And so he teaches, teaches uh, taught us um, about economics, do not oppress one another. And that's the, that's the kernel of, of a good economy. And, and yeah, the fire uh, sector will, will not join us in that. Well, you don't have to go back to the Bible or biblical times. You can look in uh, 1948 at the German economic miracle. That was a debt cancellation. You're right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I can. Sure. If I can say something, guys, that is that what we try Thank to do. Much. Can you hear me now? Now I can. Yeah, sorry, something happened with my mic. I thought it was just ignoring me. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> but no, what I was going to say is that what, you know, what we're trying to do here in Sweden with Positiva Penge is actually have a grassroots movement because we think it has to come from there if you want to get, get the difference in this. You know, because legally we have a democracy, which means we are voting, but we need to be aware of what we are voting about, okay? And we need to exercise that vote, and we need to exercise that right, and we need to get away from corrupt thinking and corrupt policies and whatever is corrupt in order to get something done. So, so actually, we do believe it's possible to change this, and I do believe it can go quite quickly why, when it starts to spread properly. And, and uh, I, 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 that's our conviction anyway. So I think grassroots movement make that go and make it go quickly and forcefully, but kindly, okay? With power, but kindly. And I, I think, I think, sorry? Especially if you're armed. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, we are armed with knowledge, knowledge, and we need to trust on our ability to, to, to make it happen. Yeah, that's my view on it. Sorry for the interruption, but anyway. So I think next up is, is actually Cecil Exam. You've been waiting a bit. Elikam, sorry. Sorry, Cecil. <laughs> yeah, okay, welcome. So can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm a first year economics student, so forgive me if I sound infantile, or if I sound 
amateur. You're not um, as infantile as you will be when you get a PhD in economics. <laughs> sure. Um, you talked about the cancellation, and I was wondering, can that be the breakout for African economies? You talked about debt cancellation, and I was wondering if that could be a breakout for African economies. I think there's an interruption in the sound. You okay. Could, can you tell, tell me what he said? Yeah, the question was if debt, debt cancellation could be used in African economies. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, you talked about debt cancellation, and I was wondering if that could be a breakout for African economies. You were wondering what? If, if it's possible or what? You talked about debt cancellation. Can you hear me? Yeah, of course. Uh, you, you have to write down the existing debts. Uh, and of course, that, nobody's really talking about that. And uh, that's what makes my analysis different from most other people. Uh, right now, the debts cannot be paid. And the question is, how are they not going to be paid? If you, the only way to pay them at present is the way they were paid after 2008, by a mass foreclosure on, uh, on uh, the property of debtors. Uh, and uh, when third world countries can't pay their debts, uh, the southern uh, uh, countries, uh, then uh, they have to sell off and privatize their public domain. Uh, the other way uh, of not paying debts is, uh, uh, resolving it, is to, have to cancel the debts. Uh, I think there has to be a third world debt rate write off, a cancellation of student debts. Uh, you, you have to really do what Germany did uh, in uh, 1948. Uh, uh, you cancel the debts, uh, and the good thing about canceling the debts is you wipe out the savings on the other side of the balance sheet. By wiping out the debts of the 99%, you wipe out the savings of the 1% and take away the uh, sledgehammer that the 1% uses to keep the rest of the economy in debt p &H. And uh, it's necessary to realize that that's the the uh, uh, existential choice that today's uh, economy has. And it's, the, it's uh, either you'll have a debt cancellation and, uh, or you'll have barbarism. And uh, basically that's what my, uh, 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 the book that I'm publishing in uh, next month, my Chinese lectures uh, are all about. Now we, we, no, we can't hear you again. Okay, uh, oh, sorry. Thanks for jumping in. Hope you were uh, happy with that answer. I, I, do you have time for a few more questions or? Okay. My eyes are getting, my eyes were uh, uh, blurry from looking at the uh, screen. So I'm closing my eyes, but yes, I, I can, I can okay. talk now that I've turned off the screen. Okay, okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, I think Joe Polita has been in the queue for some time. Can you unmute yourself? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Thanks. Fantastic presentation, Michael, as always. Um, I hope this question is on topic. Uh, here in Canada, uh, one of our major banks uh, just published a report on affordable housing. And um, one of their suggestions was that we uh, increase the amount of capital gains that are included in taxation on commercial real estate uh, deals. Um, and I know you've written about this, and I, I wondered if you could explain the logic of uh, this measure and its impact on the land prices and affordability for housing. Thank you very much. Well, capital, uh, capital gains are what landlords and speculators make in their sleep. Uh, they're a, a result of uh, banks uh, creating more and more credit uh, uh, to bid up uh, prices of property. Uh, and uh, capital gains are what you make by the banks loading the economy down with real estate debt. So, uh, and because they're unearned, the entire capital gain should be taken away, or at least 90% uh, of it. And in fact, when the first income tax uh, was there, uh, it, it, these, these would have been taxed away. Uh, the financial sector led the, uh, uh, the, uh, 
political campaign in the United States not to tax capital gains. And in Europe, England and Europe, many capital gains are not taxed at all. And that's a travesty. Most uh, financial fortunes are made not by earning interest, not by earning profits, but by capital gains. Uh, I, I've published a number of articles that are on my website showing the charts. And here's how much in profit, here's how much in capital gain. So the, uh, the, the fortunes of the 1% are not made by earning money or investing or making profits or saving up their income as capital gains. They have to be taxed away above everything else. And that was exactly what John Stuart Mill was writing about in 1848 in his uh, Principles of Political Economy with some of their applications to social philosophy. Uh, yeah, basically, he said the reason that the government should be uh, the owner of land is uh, so that you will not have uh, landlords making money in their sleep by uh, what we call capital gains now, by the in, uh, rising rental value of their property that's increasing it. And he didn't even imagine that the, rent, the uh, uh, property prices would be inflated by bank credit like they are today. So of course, uh, that's, a, that's a very good uh, suggestion. Uh, and if you tax away the capital gains, not only will you save your, yourself from the 1%, but you won't have to tax uh, Canadian labor and Canadian industry if there is any so much. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Joe. So, uh, oh no, I took away someone, who was that? Sorry, uh, Gunnar, you're up next. Gunnar Brundin. Yes, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it took some time. Uh, hello, Michael. Um, uh, I want to add to Don Wilford's question about how much should we work? Uh, uh, if uh, the central bank or if the government and the central bank gave out uh, money for um, universal basic income, what would you say about that? Uh, the question is, is the informal sector productive <laughs> as you see it? Uh, as I see it, in Sweden, we consume, uh, uh, we have a consumption as big as, as, we, as if we had 4.2 planets to, to uh, get our resources from. And I also see that the informal sector needs labor, not paid labor, but labor. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what will, if, if a part of uh, the newly created money was to go to uh, uh, basic income, what would you say? I think uh, everybody deserves uh, a ba uh, enough money to live. Uh, and uh, of course, basic income is a very good idea. Uh, my colleague, Pavlina Chernova. Uh, from the Levy Institute has written quite a bit about this. Uh, and uh, the uh, counter argument is, well, if you give everybody a basic income, they won't uh, uh, go to work. Who's going to be uh, working at McDonald's uh, and these things? Well, the solution is simple. Pay them a decent wage. Uh, once you pay a decent wage, that'll solve the problem immediately. But uh, if you're not going to pay them a basic wage, then uh, uh, of course they're not. Uh, they're not going to work for a, uh, an income that does not enable them to live. So everybody has a right to live, uh, and uh, the government uh, should support them, uh, but it should also support a basic uh, minimum wage, unlike what you have in the United States, where uh, President Biden has, uh, dedicate, has said the one thing he's going to fight against is to prevent a, a minimum wage. People, the, minimum, uh, the minimum wage in America uh, only enables you to, uh, forces you to go on public welfare. Uh, so the people work uh, for uh, uh, Walmart or other big stores here, uh, they get a wage supplement. So the government is actually paying uh, the, the wages that uh, Walmart doesn't have to do. That's a travesty. That's the Democratic Party's policy. Uh, that's the policy, the, the Democratic Party's policy is to squeeze down labor so it's absolutely driven into the market uh, and pauperized. Uh, uh, and, uh, that's why 
uh, any rate, uh, the solution is to raise the basic wage, which no party in the United States is willing to do. They fought against it like anything, and that's why they've, uh, uh, the elections here are so fraudulent uh, in preventing people like Bernie Sanders or other left-wingers from getting elected who want to pay a decent living wage. But must it be a, a wage? Why, why couldn't uh, everyone have a, a minimum basic income that you yeah, can live on? That's what I meant, basic income. Basic yes, income. It, it's, it's because then you can choose your employer. Yes. Uh, and that, that's important. Uh, and what you want to do. And, and maybe you are needed at home or in your local community or so. Yes. So, you it it's something that makes every person decide her own future and decide what to do with their lives yes otherwise you'll pauperize the economy as you're having throughout uh let's say the soviet uh, ex-soviet countries in central asia today mm. or the baltics uh mm. you're forcing a, a mass immigration from mm. countries that don't have a basic wage they have to emigrate in order to find work in order to live. Mm. Baltics, uh, Central Asia, Greece, uh, Latin America. Mm. But you, you, I mean, at the same time, you can finance the, the public sector, of course, because people won't go and lie on their bed, on their sofa, everyone. <laughs> that is not for most people. Right. No, mm. they're... Uh, there are many ways of uh, ad administering uh, around that. Nobody, uh, obviously, uh, uh, people uh, want to work, uh, want to be productive in one way or another. Yes. Yes. Uh, but the fact is, you, you want to avoid pauperization. The, the question is actually how to secure the pension, and I think that is a, a, another uh, systemic thing needed to look it, into. No. It, uh, mm. Pensions should yeah. be uh, as we've just been discussing with a basic, uh, uh, basic uh, income, pensions should be pay as you go, the way Germany does uh, by the government. You don't have to financialize pensions. That's, uh, that's what is uh, uh, one of the big problems of financialization, as uh, we discussed earlier in, in this interview. Financializing pensions is a way of uh, uh, at, uh, helping the financial sector <laughs> Uh, deindustrialize the economy. Yeah. So, and, and basically, the pension is dependent on the productive capacity of the country you're living in, because you're living on the on the real economy. So, yes. uh, but 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 I think the question is a bit bigger than than we, we can take right now. If if you don't mind, both Elizabeth and Michael, and we jump yes. forward. Hello. Uh, everyone, and uh, thank you so much, Michael, for a really good talk. Uh, I want to return to the theme you mentioned before about this uh, current Ponzi scheme that we're living in, uh, with the ever more quantitative, uh, quantitative easing and uh, these uh, uh, unprecedented zero interest uh, period that we've been in. Uh, do you see any natural end to that uh, could that go on forever? Do, do they just double the quantitative easing every five years, or uh, when will we reach a breaking point in that development? You think uh, there is no way of knowing when the breaking point would come, and I'm discussing with uh, Wall Street people all the time. We're watching the economy go down. We're watching the finance, the stock market go up. It's what you call a K-shaped recovery down for the economy, up to the financial sector. Uh, how can they, on earth, can they go up? Well, the answer is uh, the Federal Reserve uh, uh, can just uh, do the quantitative easing on and on. Of course, it can't last forever, but there's no way of knowing when the break will come. And if you look over the last few hundred years, uh, the break usually comes because uh, 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 some big bank has a fraud somewhere. Some, uh, you have a, a rogue trader making trades for himself with the bank's money that lose, uh, like the London Whale. You have uh, at AIG, uh, the uh, insurance company, uh, the, the London office made a lot of bad uh, underwrites for uh, a derivatives trade. 
will somebody make a bad bet in derivatives trade and go under? And will that pull down the whole sector? Nobody knows where the break in the chain of payments will occur or when, when it will come. But as the economy gets more overstretched and more uh, debt leveraged, uh, the economies, uh, how can the economy recover and produce profits to support rising stock prices when uh, 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 we're in the middle of debt deflation? We're, uh, it's, it's a contradiction. There's no way that uh, uh, you can have the finance sector going up and the economy going down unless you end up with feudalism, which is what happened uh, what, when this occurred in Rome 2000 years ago. Uh, uh, it, so obviously uh, this cannot, it, it, at some point we're going to end up with a huge crash, but nobody knows when it will be coming or what will trigger it. Uh, usually it'll be some accident that triggers it. Uh, people would have thought that the COVID uh, would trigger it. And maybe it will because in America uh, there's been a moratorium on uh, rent payments and uh, mortgage interest payments, and the moratoriums are about to expire. Um, when that expires, there are going to be massive evictions, uh, homeless people thrown onto the streets. Will they sleep on the subways and the parks? Will they uh, fight back? Who knows what will happen? Uh, we're moving into a, uh, an anarchic period right now, and uh, uh, but nobody can see exactly what's going to happen in chaos. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. What I would like to say then is, is that, uh, Michael, thank you very, very much for your sharing of uh, your very vast experience and actually from practical experience of being in many, many places and reading and, you know, whatever you, you know, all the things you've done and that you take your time to share it with us here. I really, really appreciate it. And we got to learn quite a lot this time. So I can say from, Everybody here and from our association, thanks a lot. And thanks for everybody who contributed and, and uh, 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 what do you say, turned up to this webinar. We're going to do, Michael, uh, a transcript as usual. It takes some time, as last time. We, our English is like, like not fluent, as you might hear. <laughs> so it takes a bit of time. But then we send over it and we're going to send links to everybody who's been here to them. Okay. So we'll be in touch. Thanks a lot, Michael, again. Do, I deeply appreciate all you share with us and from everybody else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, and sir. thanks, everybody else. See you later. Bye.